Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigella, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Mr. Sean O'Donnell, also from HHS, and he is Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health Services. Dr. Earl Strader, our Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, and today we have two special guests, Maryland State Delegate Greg Lins, as well as Montgomery County Police Department Sergeant Pat Kepp. Members of the media, thank you for joining us today. Remember to raise your hand during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm down in Annapolis again. I'll be I'm down here. Um, uh, legislature's in session, and we've got bills of interest, and so we're down paying attention. And I was down here yesterday as well. Uh, today, though, we're celebrating some exciting news um, for our local economy in the state of Maryland. Um, that's AstraZeneca is planning its second major expansion in Montgomery County in the last two months. A new $300 million investment in state-of-the-art manufacturing facility will be added to the global company's footprint here in Rockville. News was announced by the Maryland Department of Commerce because it will use a $500,000 conditional loan and through, that's available through the Advantage Maryland program to help finance the project. Montgomery County is also contributing a $100,000 conditional grant. In addition, AstraZeneca will be eligible for other incentive, incentives based on the 150 jobs that will be created by this project. Um, the new facility is going to focus on the manufacturing of the next generation of CAR T cell therapies. The work completed here will allow cancer clinical trials to be conducted around the world. Manufacturing is an area that many people do not associate with Montgomery County, but we're aggressively pursuing more manufacturing opportunities and hope for more successes like this. So this is one of the things we're talking uh, with the administration about because recently, uh, as a result, frankly, is of the couple of the trips we took overseas, we've had conversations with people interested in bringing some manufacturing facilities to the county. Um, I believe that, you know, the ability to diversify some of what we do is a good thing. And manufacturing certainly provides a window into an area that the county really hasn't been present on. We do have uh, smaller facilities that do light manufacturing, and we're trying to get into that space above light manufacturing that you know does more volume and more volume than size uh, but we're not going to become an area that with a lot of uh, gray manufacturing that deals with a lot of environmental issues much of what we're looking at now is you know pretty clean work and uh, also comes with it you know really well paying jobs and opportunities so we're excited about the opportunities that have come in front of us and where we hope we're going um, as in the coming months with uh, progress in the county. So that's been good news for us. Um, the progress Labs Industrial Park in Gaithersburg is where um, the AstraZeneca is um, one of their expansion locations. They leased another 200,000 square feet over there. And the company currently employs about 4,500 people in Montgomery County. AstraZeneca can, can conduct its leading edge cancer therapy any place on the planet. And I believe the company and other life sciences companies realize that the talent and opportunities that the area holds um, is, is great for their expansion hopes. And Montgomery County is part of, is now the nation's number three life sciences hub. So a lot of things are coming together for us and we're continuing to push on that. Uh, supporting this expansion shows our commitment to helping innovative companies uh, with their life-saving work. And I'm glad that state leaders recognize what an opportunity this is as well. And I look forward to seeing the wonderful things that come out of this new chapter for AstraZeneca. One of the things we've been working on here in Annapolis has been um, dangerous driving bills that are being introduced. Um, efforts to make Montgomery County roads safer could have an impact on aggressive driving and how it's prosecuted across the state of Maryland by the end of the year. Uh, we're now able to share details of four bills that will ch show how um, we're proposing to change how the system handles reckless and negligent driving and aggressive driving across Maryland. 
Uh, the goal is to narrow in on people who consistently show no regard for others while they're on the road. Um, the idea for this bill came about as a result of um, Montgomery County Police Department Sergeant Patrick Kep's incident where he lost parts of both his legs on I-270 while he was out of the car and trying to stop a speeding driver. Sergeant Kep and the MCPD police officers was on patrol that night and knew that driver had a history of speeding and taunting police into chasing him. Basically, he could approach a police car, take off, and know that we don't engage in high-speed chases and just do this at will. And eventually, maybe he got a ticket, but it was, you know, it had no impact on his behavior. Police say that the driver targeted the officer and intentionally hit him. In this case, attempted murder charges have been filed, but that's certainly not the norm with many other dangerous driving incidents in our, on our roads right now. And to think this happened um, to somebody here, one of our police officers, even though we knew the driver had a history of reckless driving, you know, it's, it's a real tragedy, but it also shows just the inadequacy of what the system does to people who are um, insistent on driving as recklessly as possible and making a point of it. It's imperative to protect our police officers and our community from similar actions. That means getting a lot tougher on drivers who've shown no indication they're going to change their behavior on their own. So Senate Bills 939 and 940, along with House Bills 1111 and 1160, but established new benchmarks for reckless driving, including anyone caught going more than 90 miles an hour. The bill would also clarify what constitutes aggressive driving. That includes ignoring lights and sirens from law enforcement, breaking the rules of the road while passing other cars on the right or left, and performing car tricks like drifting, peeling out, doing donuts um, in the middle of a road. Uh, another goal of these proposed laws is to force offenders into a court date. Right now, it's way too easy for a driver just to pay a fine and then get back in the car and go back on the road and do what they were doing before. Uh, my team has been working with Senator Nancy King and Delegate Greg Wims to get these changes to the state's criminal law and transportation articles introduced in Annapolis. I want to thank them for their collaboration and their work on behalf of everyone on the road. And I'd like to welcome Delegate Greg Wims uh, so he can talk a little bit more about the introduction of the House bills and how it can impact community safety. So take a moment and turn this over to Greg. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. And uh, this is indeed a bill that uh, I feel so strongly about, and I think the residents of Maryland will. And as you just said, there are two bills in the House and two bills in the Senate. Uh, but first, before I do that, and we will hear from uh, Sergeant Kep uh, after I speak, I want to just give you a little background on our hero, as I call him. Uh, he is a Maryland resident, uh, graduated with a business degree from Towson University, has been with the Montgomery County Police Department for a decade. He's currently uh, working with the Alcohol Initiative Unit within the department, which is comprised of one corporal and five officers. Now he's in rehab now, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to say, as far as I'm concerned, and as we go to the house and we have our first hearing, I'm gonna actually call it the uh, Sergeant uh, Pat uh, Kep uh, bill on reckless driving and then criminal law. So the first one, as you said, Mr. County Executive, is House Bill 1-1, which, which 11-11, I mean, which pretty simply says this, that we will change the laws a little to include reckless endangerment in the use of a vehicle in a manner that creates substantial risk of death or risk of serious injury uh, by someone driving a vehicle. The second bill, which is House Bill 1160, the bill would create stronger penalties on drivers for allowing the unauthorized use of a vehicle, as well as the stronger penalties for reckless endangerment and aggressive driving. This is something, as I talk to my colleagues on the House, that they see, House side see, that is important because in the past, the way the law is written, uh, there could be reckless driving, but the penalties, quite frankly, were very soft. So we hope that with these stronger penalties, this will make a big difference in maybe being a deterrent so that a hero like Sergeant Kep uh, would not be injured. And with that, I would like the, for us to hear now from Sergeant Kep. So Sergeant, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Delegate Wims, and, and I very much appreciate um, your support, Senator King, uh, Executive Elrich, uh, Dr. Stoddard, everyone's, you know, willingness to uh, involve me in this process as well as law enforcement in general. Uh, it, it means a lot to have everyone want to involve law enforcement uh, and myself in these efforts to strengthen our laws, make our roadways safer. Uh, obviously, my situation was uh, much different than most, unfortunately. Um, I've said from the beginning that uh, good will come from all this, and um, this will be some of the good that comes from it to make our roadway safer, to make my job hopefully a little bit easier. And uh, with my team in the alcohol enforcement unit uh, or alcohol initiative unit and alcohol enforcement section officers that are out there trying to do this job to make our roadway safer and, you know, give a little more teeth to some of um, some of our laws, because um, as as both of you mentioned already, it's you know, it's somewhat frustrating when someone can just uh, continue someone like, you know, and I won't speak too much specifically to my case, just because it's, it's open and pending um, and everything like that. But, you know, it gets frustrating on all officers and, and I'm sure the courts and on both the judiciary and the state's attorney side, when we do have these repeat offenders, whether it's repeat drunk drivers, whether it's repeat uh, speeders and reckless and aggressive drivers um, that continue to do their actions and have uh, little recourse uh, for them. So I'm very, very thankful um, that everyone has taken the uh, initiative on this. I'm sorry it took what it took to, you know, have to have this happen. But uh, again, good will come from it, and I'm and I'm very thankful for it. Um, as Delegate Wims mentioned, I'll, I'll give a little update for those um, here and in, in the media. And I know I spoke with. Uh, Executive Elrich yesterday at Annapolis, I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited to the state of the state address. So uh, I was down there and um, spoke to the governor a little bit, but um, I'm here at Walter Reed right now uh, doing rehab. My rehab pretty much goes from 945 until um, 215 every day. Um, some days like today, uh, it's going to be a little bit longer in the afternoons, but uh, I have prosthetics. I'm up and um, walking around with a walker, uh, difficult, just relearning how to walk again, but, um, it's, uh, it's going to be a long process. I'm, I'm far, far away from being back at work or being, uh, you know, back officiating football or doing things like that. But, um, I'm here at Walter Reed and getting what I truly believe is, uh, the best treatment possible, uh, in the world for prosthetics, um, and, uh, you know, recovering well. So I'm very, uh, in a good way, anxious and ready to get down to Annapolis and start, you know, pushing for these bills and testifying and, and making sure that we can can get our roadway safer and continuing this, um, you know, the work with everybody, the collaborative effort that we all have. I think yesterday it was mentioned uh, very much in, you know, early on in the governor's uh, speech about partnership was one of his words. And I think that that's a huge thing about this is the partnership that we have between uh, the legislators, myself, uh, Dr. Stoddard on the executive side and, um, uh, council, uh, council, county executive Elrich, on that uh, side, having the support of uh, the county legislators, the legislators, and also the support of the executives within the Montgomery County Police Department. It's a great partnership that we have, and I'm very thankful and fortunate that we uh, we've been able to do that and get this uh, going as it has. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeant Kep, and uh, also Delegate Williams. Uh, members of the media, we're going to open it up right now for questions and answers regarding uh, about the bills, uh, about safer roads. Raise your hands and uh, we'll call on you if you have any questions for the sergeant, the delegate, or the county executive on this topic. Other topics towards the end of this uh, presentation. Let's see. Any questions? One more second. Any questions? Raise your hands. Oh, there it is. Lydia Hurley. Good afternoon, Lydia. How are you? Capital News Service. Go ahead. Ask your question. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my question is for Sergeant Kep. Um, I was just wondering, in between the time of your um, your incident and now, um, how has it been getting into advocacy um, so close after your rehab has started? And kind of what was that process like choosing to get involved um, with the on the legislative level um, before you can get back to work? I I think I made that very clear to um, Mr. Elrich when he came and visited me, Dr. Stoddard um, and Mr. Maddaleno and uh, Chief Jones and pretty much everybody that was there. I mean, I, I said that, you know, one, I was going to be back at work. 
uh, two, I'd be back officiating college football and three that good would come from it. And I made it very clear very early on when um, I can't remember who it was, but, you know, came up to me and, and brought up the conversation about new laws being created. And, and right away, that's immediately something I've, you know, I'm, I wanted, wanted to do. It's, it's, it has no, my, I guess the easy way to say it is my, my status here being in rehab really has no bearing on wanting to make our roadways safer. You know, I've always, it's been a passion of mine. It's, I've been a traffic officer in a sense, you know, someone who's a, a road dog, someone out there, you know, enforcing the traffic laws, making arrests, especially impaired driving enforcement. That's been my career. And um, I've always wanted to, especially thinking back to Noah's law uh, after uh, Officer Liotta passed, um, you know, I wanted to be involved in those efforts. And now having the chance to be involved in them, my rehab has, you know, no real impact on that. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to I want to be there in Annapolis. I will be there in Annapolis uh, to make these bills happen. Um, I will also make sure that my rehab is is continuing. That's that's the first priority. But yeah, it's it's it really no thought to you know the two going side by side. It's uh, it's just something that I it needs to be done, and I I want to be there, and I think it'll be you know more impactful if I'm there speaking about uh, you know my incident and, and advocating for it. Thank you, thank you, media members of the media. Any other questions for the sergeant? and or the delegate. No more questions about this topic? If not, I did want to add one thing. It just so happens I had breakfast uh, this morning with a group with the governor and the superintendent of the Maryland State Police were there and superintendent asked me to definitely let him know when the hearings are coming, he would like to be there in support of this bill. And as mentioned earlier, the governor has said that too. So I'll reach out to his people so that uh, we can make sure we get both in the Senate with Senator King and with me in the House uh, that they're passed and be signed by the governor. So thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Judy first with uh, the Greater Only News has her hand up. Good afternoon, Judy. Good afternoon. Um, Sergeant, I was wondering in light of the Noah Leota incident of 2015, what is morale like on the police department? Uh, you know, police officers are now going out doing their job and we've had at least these two very horrific incidents. Um, what it what is it like? I mean, is it the oh no, not again? Sort of thoughts within the department. Um, I, I think that's going to be difficult for me to speak to. I've obviously been you know out of the department for you know since October eighteenth. I haven't been at work. I obviously still you know communicate with a, a huge group of people that are within the department because that's been my uh, support network. I think everybody is you know very supportive and and frustrated and upset that this happened again you know fortunately it was my outcome versus you know what very well could have been another situation like no liata um but i think the oh, there is overall frustration uh, amongst everybody about the enforcement or the the total process of what starts with traffic enforcement and ends with court. And again, nobody is looking for everybody to be thrown in jail or everybody to have huge fines or everybody to lose their license. That's, that's not the, the goal of all of this. But when we look at the repeat offenders, the terrible, you know, drivers that are out there, I think there is frustration that there's not more that's being done um, to, you know, have some some sort of penalties and sanctions to those people. And I, I see that within myself and within my unit, which is really all that I can truly speak to. I, I can't speak necessarily to the entire department, but I do think there is some frustration out there that, you know, things aren't happening. But, uh, you know, on the, the side of the things happened again, yeah, I think it's, you know, kind of the oh no, but there's been a huge rally behind me for sure. And, and the support has been immense and, and it's just been absolutely incredible. Um, the law enforcement network here in Montgomery County, in the state of Maryland, uh, like Delegate Wims, I, I spoke to uh, Colonel Butler yesterday. It, it's it's huge in Maryland and then all across the, the country has been has supported me. So the support is there, the morale is there and positive for me and to, to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Members of the media, any other questions regarding this topic? No more questions? Well, Delegate Wims, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry, thanks for joining us as well. You can remain on the call or you can drop off if you have 
to go. Mr. Connick, seconded. So first of all, I want to just thank Sergeant Kep for being here. Uh, it was good seeing him in Annapolis yesterday, and I appreciate um, his absolute determination to get back to work as soon as possible. Um, I th that is, it is great to see, and I know you're going to be back there sooner than later, uh, and that's encouraging. And I just want you, you to know that I think a lot of us share the frustration with how how long it takes to get any kind of serious sanctions for people doing really dangerous things. You know, we're not talking about, you know, small things here. We're talking about, you know, incredible speeding, putting people at risk on a regular basis. Even uh, the people who think like doing death of a crowd is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. All it takes is like a moment's loss of control over that vehicle. And instead of being entertaining, entertaining, it would take little to transform it into a deadly incident. And I feel like we're just waiting for the first one to happen so people can say, we told you it was deadly, now maybe you do something. And that's a ridiculous way to go about enforcing things that I think we know are dangerous. So uh, I was happy that you know we started pushing this legislation right away. I wanna thank um, Greg and Nancy for being sponsors for us on this. It's very fitting. And uh, I just want you to know that we're gonna continue on this and other things to try to make sure that people just simply can't repeat, 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 because it just doesn't make any sense to allow that. And I look forward to seeing you in the office or in your car out on the street. Thank you. Um, Thank you, sir. Speaking of public safety and MCP day, MCPD, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, guns and hiring. Uh, this week, uh, the County Council's Public Safety Committee I received an update on 2023 crime trends from the Montgomery County Police Department, and they show the proliferation of guns continues to be a major factor in the crimes we see. And more than three out of every five homicides investigated in 2023, of them, um, almost one in two of the robberies um, involved the firing arms. So three out of five hom homicides and one out of every two robberies. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about ghost guns, because this is, I think, one of the most disturbing things and probably falls in the same line as our earlier com conversation of just tolerating stuff that's, that's just frankly nuts. So if you, you know, if you wanted to buy a gun, say a nine millimeter pistol, you would have to go normally through a registration and approval process. It's not onerous. You can get an approval. People get them all the time. And it's pretty straightforward. Ghost guns aren't treated like guns. So you can go online and order a ghost gun. For those of you who wonder what a ghost gun is, because I use that word a lot, I don't think we explain it. You buy a kit or you buy pieces separately. And then you assemble the gun out of the kit. Some of the kits come with handy dandy videos that will tell you how to put all this together. You don't have to register that gun. You don't need you don't need proof of registration to get that gun. If you are buying a handgun mail order, it has to go to a licensed dealer in Montgomery County. You have to wait and you have to demonstrate that you've got a license to get that gun in the state of Maryland. The ghost gun doesn't require any of that. And so you you can get a friend to order it for you. You can order it yourself. Um, enforcement and, you know, looking at what a person's age and other things is very difficult to prove. There are plenty of ways to get a fake ID and, you know, not be 16 or not be 14 or get a friend who's older to get the gun. But the biggest problem is they go onto the streets, they're not registered, and people know those guns aren't registered. You could use it, you could toss it, and if it gets tossed and you don't have any prints on it, nobody knows who that gun was sold to. And so it's a problem and they're proliferating. And as much as people like to say, there are lots of guns on the street and you can buy them out of a trunk of somebody's car. That's all true and that's a big enough problem. Adding this to the mix has just made the problem worse. And we need to eliminate the ability of people to buy ghost guns in the state, period. And I, I hope that we can see how far the state can take this or we can get national legislation as hard as that is out of certain members of Congress at some point, 
you, people have got to say, okay, it's legal. You can have it. You can register it. Why would you let people get it without getting the gun registered? It just makes no sense unless you're a person who has no business getting a gun. Um, that's the only excuse for trying to get around uh, what I think are safe and sane protections for people. So as much as we all talk about how many guns are on the street, it's our own laws and the laxness of the laws that's contributing to how many guns are on the street. And hopefully uh, we can get some help in dealing with this. If we could deal with it at a local level, we would have done it a long time ago. Um, we don't have the ability to do that, but the people who do have the ability to do it need to do it. Uh, the biggest spike in crime in the county between 22 and 23 came from auto thefts. And uh, crime analysts attributed that to a flaw in the ignition systems of some Hyundai and Kia cars that made them very popular targets for auto thefts. So the flaw in the ignition system has been exposed on social media. And so anybody can go on social media, figure out how to start one of these two cars. You don't need a key, you don't need complicated tools. Um, it's pretty easy. And it's led to a rash of um, thefts and more than half of the vehicles uh, that were most most recently reported stolen were either Kias or Hyundais in this category. So it's a problem. Um, if you are an owner of one of those cars, you should probably check with your dealers about updates to protect your car. And I know there's uh, people are trying to figure out workarounds to stop that, but they've been a big factor um, and more people stealing cars and more people stealing Hyundais and Kias. I mean, the easier it is to take your car, the more likely you are to have a theft. If you have to do complicated things that you're not sure of, that in the process itself is a deterrent. But when this is as simple as just plugging something in, not much of a deterrent. Uh, we've, launched, we've launched new initiatives in the county to help enhance our police response to crime in general. Um, most recently, we introduced a pilot program that's called the Drone as First Responder, and we introduced it in Silver Spring and Wheaton. Um, more locations will be added in coming months. I think people feel it's already working. The drone is used uh, when a crime is reported because it can arrive on the scene faster. So if you think about the night I went out and I went on a ride along in Silver Spring, and I was, one, I was in one of nine uh, cars that went out that night. It's, that wasn't downtown Silver Spring. It was Greater Silver Spring. And I think many of you know how what Greater Silver Spring means. It's really big. And you had nine cars out. And uh, if there's a call for a crime, cars aren't always like a block away and you can get there quickly. So in downtown Silver Spring, we've got a drone on top of a building, same in Wheaton. And if they get a call, they can dispatch a drone to the scene. If they've got a decision description, of a suspect, uh, the drone gets there faster, it can identify the suspect, it can follow the suspect. Uh, we had an incident where the drone followed the suspect to a bus, or reported the bus that the person got on, and the police were there waiting for the person. And I think the next bus stop or bus two bus stops down and took them off the bus. So the drones are gonna help us get on the scene faster, help us identify people, help us track people before police can get on the scene. We think it's going to be a real enhancement to the work we do. And we're going to be putting more of these out um, on the, uh, for those of us concerned about um, privacy, the drones, you know, observe um, the kind of, the kind of privacy all of us I think wanted. It's, it does not fly down the street and identify who's walking down the street. It's not going to have the database of everybody's photograph and to figure out who's in downtown Silver Spring at night. Uh, as it approaches the scene, the camera is pointed up and away from buildings, so it's not going to be flying by anybody's apartment building. Um, it's The cameras come down and, and get to the right location when they're actually on the scene and have something to look at, which is, which is a target of their interest. So We've instilled as many things as we can in order to protect privacy and not have this become another thing in the privacy world to worry about. Um, but it is enhancing public safety, and it's one of the tools that, that is available now to do that. But we've added other technologies as well. We now have our license plate readers um, 
that on our on the cameras in our cars that are helping police identify stolen cars. And license plate readers are now routinely scanned plates. So if somebody's driving down the street and a plate pops up on the camera, the camera will look at the plate number and can determine whether that's just a regular vehicle going about its business or if it's a stolen vehicle or a stolen plate. And so, you know, this is another way that our officers have been able to identify vehicles before they've been able to do anything. And that's really critical to be able to, to get the, to speed up the process of identifying stolen vehicles. We're adding more public security cameras in high traffic areas like parking garages and highly traffic streets. I think if you're in downtown Silver Spring, you'll notice we not only have um, some cameras in garages, but we actually have cameras on the streets now. Um, I think, you know, this is not the kind of thing you do with great, you know, excitement because you realize that all of these are things that in some sense can add to people's anxiety, but the fact is they are deterrents to crime and they're um, more likely to be increasing people's security than jeopardizing people's security. So they're there. Um, they're going to help us and they'll continue to help us and we'll be expanding technology as we can. We're making a priority though to add more police officers on the street. Uh, at the end of the day, what we do is really limited by the lack of, of officers in our department. We're approaching 200 vacancies in the department as people retire. We have a force that was older and a lot of people coming up against the period in their life when they can actually retire on the police force, so it exacerbates everything else. And recruiting continues to be difficult. One of the first things we've done is we've hired a recruitment firm that was used successfully in Fairfax County uh, to target recruitment uh, with quality candidates. And Fairfax County seemed to have a good experience. We're gonna see if we can replicate that experience here. Um, we're looking at things we can do to take uniformed officers out of desk jobs. We have officers who, you know, could be on a street, but they're occupying a desk job. We're looking for opportunities to fill the desk jobs with civilians or with officers, um, maybe coming back to the force just to do that and allowing these people to go out on patrol. We are actually looking at allowing ourselves to rehire uh, police officers who retire from the police department or have left the police department. Uh, we raised uh, police officer pay to make our salaries competitive with surrounding jurisdictions and we provided signing bonuses um, as steps to attract more talented candidates to come to Montgomery County. Uh, you know, I've said this before, I, you know, one of the first increases I proposed uh, in terms of wages with, was to the police department in my first term because we knew they were beginning to lose officers and we knew that our pay wasn't competitive. And at that time, we weren't able to get it through the council that was in, that was in existence then. Fortunately, new council has been much more willing to deal with uh, pay incentives and competitiveness in pay, which is gonna help us keep and retain and attract officers to come here. We're also gonna be changing the college degree requirement that we've been requiring an associate's degree it's a real deterrent because people can go to other departments, many other departments and get hired without an associate's degree. So we're talking about making college requirements, education requirements built into our training, built into the first few years that a person joins the police force. Um, if you think about it practically, a lot of people who go to community college, which is the degree that was required, they don't go full time because they're often adults who are having to work and it's hard to carry a full academic load and a, and a full um, workload. So instead of getting a degree in two years, sometimes folks are stretching out degrees to three, four, even longer. And if we could focus on what classes we want people to have and do this through how we either train or how we require things during the first years of a person's employment, we can do this in a way that allows a person to work um, the county can cover the cost of the education requirements and we can get people into our department and get them the courses they need, um, but tailored to what courses they really need. I mean, a 60 degree, a 60 credit degree doesn't necessarily add anything to your ability to be a police officer. 
And so it matters what classes you actually take. So this is a discussion we're going to have, but it's the direction we're absolutely going to be moving in. As I said, we're looking to change the regulations to allow us to rehire former, former public safety employees. Um, we could bring them back. We have a call center, which is another part of our police response or public safety response. It is way short of staff. It is a very difficult job, a very stressful job. And uh, we'd like to be able to, to bring people back. And it's a perfect job for somebody who wants wants to come back and maybe work just one or two days a week. Uh, we're going to be flexible on hiring and shifts because we need to fill those positions. We need to do things different than we've been doing in order to uh, get people back in, into these positions where they can help us and they can earn some extra money. And a lot of these people are going to work someplace else. They could just as easily work here. And we're kind of silly for letting them go anyplace else, but not letting them work here. So we're looking to change that. And one of the last things we're working on is the state has a uh, limitation on hiring police officers. If you smoke marijuana, you can't get hired. So if you, on, if you answer an application honestly, um, and you wind, up, you wind up not being hired, you will go to most other departments, except in the state of Maryland, where you can get hired. We've got a, a board in the state, which is being an obstacle to getting rid of the, um, the ban on hiring people. Uh, we need to hire people. It's legal here. And the law was passed, and smoking marijuana was not supposed to be an impediment to a job. Apparently, this board is continuing to make it an impediment. We need police officers. They're not doing anything that anybody else doesn't do. So we need to stop pretending and we need to have a more open approach to how we deal with this. And those are things that can actually make a real difference in our hiring people in Montgomery County. I think it's pretty obvious that there are a pretty large number of people that smoke marijuana. Many of them live totally normal, useful lives doing you know things that all the rest, everybody does in normal life. And this one thing could keep them from becoming a police officer. It doesn't make any sense. So we need to bring our laws up to date with uh, reality. Uh, we want to send a really clear s signal that we have been changing our department. We have a changing department and that we want to encourage people to build their public safety careers here in Montgomery County. We're focused on community policing, but adding more officers is critical to fulfilling that goal and reducing crime. The shortage of officers is the biggest challenge we face. I went on a ride along, like I said, a couple months ago, and it was apparent from you know what I saw that the officers basically seemed to just go from one call to, to another. Uh, instead of patrolling and you know, going up and down streets and you know just looking in on the community, they basically go to answer one call, they finish with a call, then they go to another call, it takes away from having a proactive presence. And you can't do that when you don't have enough officers to adequately cover uh, the beats we have. So we're really committed to adding officers in so that we can actually cover the beats and, and get the kind of coverage and protection that people want. So we're working on a lot of different things to make sure that people get the policing they want. We think that in, all these things together can kind of restore a better balance here in the county. So I'm looking to get forward to working with the department, with the union, and with the public and making sure we put the pieces in place that we need to put in place. I'm going to end now just on the COVID front. Uh, it's been relatively good news. New data shows a decrease across the board in new cases and hospitalizations uh, due to the virus. And when you compare state hospitalizations over the last several weeks, we're now back to pre-holiday levels. So that wave that occurred when people were out visiting relatives, we seem to have gone through that. So we're making progress. Uh, there's also positive information to share about the vaccine. There was a new study uh, that was shared by the Centers for Disease Control that showed that the latest vaccine, which is the only one available now, helped it increase protection against the disease by more than 50%. It was found to be effective against the now dominant strain, which is called JN1. And the study was not able to determine how long that protection helps someone before the vaccine begins to wane. Um, the study is another good reason to seek out every vaccination that you're eligible for, because if it, 
it's not too late uh, in the flu season to protect yourself and your family from all the respiratory illnesses. Um, I will say that, you know, anecdotally, my experience and the experience of most people I've known who've um, gotten second cases of COVID but been previously vaccinated or m most recently boosted, um, everybody I know has had a case that's pretty mild. And uh, particularly, I can compare my first experience to my second experience. I'll take my second experience any day. Uh, it was, I, I wasn't thrilled. Um, but it was not nearly as unpleasant and difficult as my first round with it. And I think that's generally been people's experiences that I've talked to. So I'm going to turn this over to the health team now, and then we'll hear from the media. Um, thank you, Mr. County Executive. And I, I just want to share, I had a similar experience, a very mild um, second uh, COVID infection. And uh, I, I know that this is something that we, uh, now live with. Um, it will come in waves each year. Um, but the important thing in living with this is to to get boosted uh, annually as you're recommended to, uh, again, to reduce the the burden, um, both the impact to yourself and the burden on our healthcare system. I just want to uh, share for, for one second um, uh, just a little bit of data to, to go into some additional detail here. Um, and there we go. Um, and so you can see, this is a chart we've shared in the past that the upper graph is showing our outpatient visits to hospitals and some of our um, urgent care uh, with diagnoses of any type of respiratory illness. And you can see those numbers are coming down um, and the lower graph are showing our uh, outpatient COVID um, uh, visits to outpatient centers at different age groups. And you can see these are all coming down again after our our, uh, our high point in the season. Um, if these continue, we anticipate in the next week or so, the state may lift its guidance for um, universal masking at healthcare facilities. Um, but we, we want to, uh, again, remind people, COVID's still spreading out there. If you are at increased risk, um, for complications from COVID, um, please feel free to wear a mask when you when you uh, go to the, a healthcare facility where there's lots of other sick people. Um, and if you go to other crowded places, it, again, that can be a, a helpful protection. Um, as far as inpatients go, uh, you can see here, these are our county numbers. They have, they've come down from the previous week by quite a bit. Um, they're, they're still, we still have a, a um, 41 patients in our hospitals with a COVID diagnosis, um, but these numbers have been coming down and we, we hope they'll continue to come down. And this is our influenza numbers, which again, we're still in the flu season. You can see they're still elevated, but they have come down from uh, the, the end of the year numbers, which were quite high. Uh, they've continued to come down. So those were the that was some of the data I just wanted to share with, with you all so you could see where we were going. Um, Happy to turn it over to, to questions, um, unless Dr. Bridgers or Dr. Stoddard have uh, any additional comments. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. None for me uh, this week. Yeah, no additional comments there. All right, so we can open it up uh, for uh, public health questions and any, any other topics. Uh, members of the media, raise your hands and uh, we'll call on you. If you have any questions this afternoon for our officials. Darcy Spencer, good afternoon, NBC4, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is for all questions? Yes, correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm covering the uh, hearing this afternoon regarding uh, the Montgomery County Council hearing um, where they're bringing in the Inspector General uh, yeah. regarding her report on the uh, Bidelman related investigation as well as the, the President of the Board uh, of Education and I know Mr. Elbridge had spoken uh, to our Paul Wagner on Friday um, when everything kind of broke about the school superintendent stepping down. Um, just in light of the meeting today, um, if, if he could just talk a little bit about, you know, what what he needs to know. Um, I, I just talked to someone with the council. It was like they still have a lot of questions. Um, a lot of money is being sent into the school system, but there's not a lot of knowledge about where the money's going and specifically with the settlement agreement um, uh, with Dr. McKnight, how much money uh, was paid and things like that. Just what are your thoughts on that? 
ahead of that hearing today? Um, I, I guess I've, you know, I've got a broad range of thoughts on this. I mean, first of all, the IG's report, you know, if you if you read it, you notice it didn't mention anybody. So it talks about a flawed system, but, but the system didn't actually lead to making bad decisions. People made bad decisions. And so we still don't know who any of these people are. Maybe a few of them you can guess because somebody is no longer working with the school system or somebody got moved to a different position. But there's been no, like, this happened here, this person did this. These are the things, you know, that are problematic. So you, they need a system with better safeguards. But this stuff goes back a long way. And, you know, one of the things that that I find challenging when I look at this is, you know, there's a report in there that's cited at, in 2019. If you were to talk to the union, you'd find out the union sent there were complaints about people either at that point or even earlier. And there's no discussion about any of that. Um, Bidelman wasn't the only potential case that should have had more attention. So far, it seems to be the only case that's gotten more attention. And it, it shows if when you start looking at the dates, that multiple superintendents were given information about this. And I'm going to guess multiple people on school boards had some inkling about this and nothing ever happened about it. So that's, um, that's an issue to think about and to understand how we do, how we're going to go forward from here. Um, I'd say just in general, you know, we have, we have a part-time school board. And I don't think people realize, you know, A, a it is part-time, B, they have very little staff. Uh, I'm a former, you know, council member. When I was on the council, the county government budget and the school budget is basically half of the total $6 billion plus budget in the county. As a county council member who's supposed to be analyzing budgets and making recommendations, because remember the councils, it doesn't oversee departments and isn't, um, does isn't running departments. They're basically looking at information and making decisions about what to do. But they have like four or five staff members for each of them. They've got an entire fl floor of people who can do research. So if a council member had an idea and wanted to know something, or if they you know heard that the county government wanted to do something, or maybe somebody else was interested in doing something, they've got the tools to investigate um, council members have staff, their own staff to investigate and follow up on things. The school board has no staff. The only staff they were given was staff to do basically public relations, interface with the public. That's nice. But if I'm going to be in a position of being responsible for oversight, oversight is not done by having somebody be your interface between you and the public oversight is done by having people who can actually do research and analysis for you and tell you if a superintendent proposes a program and they say, I think this is the best thing for sliced bread. Maybe you go and look at other jurisdictions that have sliced bread the same way and see whether they think it's sliced bread having done that or whether there are people who said this didn't really pan out, but you don't have a board that can do that. And I really think we need to think, long and hard about giving a board the tools, considering making these full-time jobs so that they can oversee a $3 billion budget with the kind of attention that a $3 billion budget deserves. And if, if we're not willing to do that, then basically you have a board that functions as a rubber stamp. You know, the superintendent says something over, if you can't investigate, if you can't research, you're left in, in the position of either denying based on instinct or going along with it because this is what you know. And I just feel like the system deserves something better. I don't blame the school board on that, except they could have added staff positions to help them with research. And they've not been willing to do that over the years. Um, this is something I think they ought to take a bite at and try to solve. Uh, I wouldn't replicate the council, but I'd certainly start by giving them some staff um, to work with. So I think you're going to find a lot of questions. That's my, my general comment last time was um, there are a lot of questions to which no answers have been provided. We'll see if any answers get provided today. I hope so.
Thank you, Darcy. I see Lily Zhang from Fox 5 DC has her hand up. Go ahead, Lily. Hi, thank you for uh, entertaining questions about this. Um, for the county executive, In as you know, there has been an interim superintendent that's been named this week. In light of what's happening with this report and so much attention on it, do you have any advice for this interim superintendent as there are calls for more transparency when it comes to school board and school handlings? Well, if the superintendent has the authority to do that, she would just ought to require that all the things, all the public information be released. You know, redact whatever the names of the innocent so they don't, don't get caught up in this. But if, if the reports point to things, people need to know what the reports point to. Um, if there are more specific flaws in the processes, we ought to know about the more specific flaws. Um, and if it's deeper and goes back years, we ought to be honest about where it goes back because it's just, it's, there's, I think there's a lot of unease in parts of the community that all this is being visited on this superintendent. When everybody knows, and you can just look at the dates and tell that other superintendents knew what was going on and didn't do anything about it. So this, this is a longstanding issue. And I think transparency might help not only to better understand it, but to acknowledge that it's a longstanding problem, not just the creature of, you know, the person who was there in this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Members of the media, any more questions for the county officials this afternoon? Any more questions? It's going once, going twice. I guess we're done for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.